It's time for Remodel Revolution. And now, an award-winning contractor with over 40 years experience. Here is Alex Guthrie. Welcome to another episode of Remodel Revolution. I'm your host, Alex Guthrie. This is the vodcast where we have no sports, no news, and no mean people. We're coming to you from deep in the heart of the great state of Texas. And we are going to have a fantastic show today. You know, it's so hot. It is so hot here in Texas all of a sudden that I decided that today we would go to Colorado. So we're going like most Texans do. So we're going to uh, go up and we're going to visit with our friends in Colorado, John Taylor and Liz Newman, right after these words. Well, I'll tell you what, when it, when it reaches 100 degrees here, uh, down here in deep in the heart of the great state of Texas, most people start thinking about the mountains. How do I get out of this hot weather? And for uh, all my, my lifetime, we've always just jumped in the car. We head up to the mountains in Colorado. They're the closest ones and the most beautiful. And uh, we've uh, developed quite a, uh, quite a reputation up there in Colorado, us Texans. Uh, they, uh, some people like us and some people don't. But I have some friends up there that everybody likes because they're great people. John Taylor, welcome to the show. Hey, Alex. Thank you so much. And I've got bad news for you. It was 100 degrees here yesterday. Oh. A, a heat wave and um, our electricity has gone out. So oh, yeah, well, having Texas weather. You know, I, somehow I don't feel sorry for you. You're in the mountains. Deal with it. <laughs> That's true. And we still don't have cockroaches. So there's and that. You, you have cold water in your streams and we don't. <laughs> We do, but it's still great to be up here, and uh, the folks from Colorado have learned to accept us folks from Texas, and you know what? I think all these people coming from California helps us out quite a bit. So yeah, that's all. right. That's right. They yeah. make us look better. They do. They do, for sure. So you've been up there 10 years or so? A little bit over. Uh, Kim and I came up here, and we bought actually our first house in 2012, and um, we had an energy company, and we found... Fort Collins was sort of by accident and we fell in love with the place and we said, you know, if we could live next to these mountains, do we think we want to go back to Dallas? And <laughs> um, for once she agreed with me and we've been here ever since. Well, I tell you, I, I, it's, uh, we were talking earlier and I've spent quite a bit of time in my life in Colorado. I, I love, I love the state. I love the people. Um, uh, it's, it's just, it's just such a beautiful place to be and a wonderful place to be in the summertime. So congratulations on that. And you do, uh, primarily residential real estate. Is that correct? That is correct. And so, yeah, so go, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, when I started thinking about how I wanted to round out my career, I had been in uh, commercial real estate and had done commercial banking. And I thought, you know what, this is a great place to do this. Colorado, Fort Collins area is always in the top 10 happiest, best places to live, and people always want to seem to move here. So we've got um, a lot of people coming actually from all over the country, not just Colorado and Texas. And it's turned out to be a really rewarding thing to be doing here in Fort Collins. Yeah, Fort Collins is just uh, such a great town. Um, I remember it from back in the 70s when it was a little, I think it was a little college town back then. Um, Let's talk about some of the challenges uh, that were, I, I think, I, I guess the sense I'm getting with the people that I've been interviewing around the country is that this mm -hmm. is just sort of a national thing that's going on. 
But there's been a lot of challenges in the residential new home business. And part of what you do is new homes. That's what you focus on. Yeah. Um, one of the things that it, it, I, has shocked me about Dallas, and I don't know if you've been back here any time recently, I never thought that this city could get built out. I just thought there's no way. There's too many cotton fields around here to cover up for it to get built out. But by gosh, it's getting there where you're having to drive forever to get to, uh, first of all, to find land and a house that you can afford. And then you've got to commute in for an hour, hour and a half. It's, it's starting to look like LA around here. Yeah. Um, are you guys having, do, do you have challenges finding dirt in around Fort Collins or in Colorado? You know, it's interesting because there's a ton of land in Colorado. Um, but finding dirt in the right places has been the challenge. Mm -hmm. So the Fort Collins area, we've got a bunch of different, call it microclimate. So you've got Fort Collins, you've got Loveland, and it's a challenge going to the west because we've got a huge granite wall that's capped with snow, and that sort of stops us there. And when you go to the east, we've got a little town called Greeley, and there's a floodplain on that side of it. So there's kind of a donut hole right here in the center of, we'll call it the golden triangle between Greeley, Fort Collins, and Loveland, where I'm actually in Windsor, which is kind of the center of it. And most of the new construction um, and the land that's being built upon is in this area and in a town of Bertha. And actually, Alex, one of the challenges that we really have in this area is dealing with legislation from the different cities and some of the fees that the builders have to deal with and affordable housing. So uh, the tracks that are being built on are tending to kind of move away from Fort Collins and to move to the more periphery cities that are, uh, let's call it more builder friendly. How about that? The uh, the NAHB, I can't remember if it's NAHB or the Texas Association of Builders, the regulation, percentage of regulation for these builders was 23% of the cost of a home. It was ridiculous. It's It's got to the point to where it's, that's is almost as bad as the lumber cost increase. But when you when you add the two together, it's a huge number. It, it's adding you know a ridiculous amount of dollars to a, a typical twenty five hundred foot house. Um, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So I feel your pain there. Yeah. And we have additional challenges too. So when water is a big thing in Colorado, yes, and it it's is. headwater state, right? Mm -hmm. But you've got the Colorado River, um, and so I'm in Windsor, and the Rocky Mountain National Park is 45 minutes away. That's the headwaters for the Colorado River, which has not reached the Sea of Cortez except for once in the last 20 years. That is amazing. It, yeah, it's sad. And then to the east of us, Kansas really handed it to Colorado over water rights. And so when we first got here, rain barrels were illegal. And being a native Texan, I was like, you mean to tell me I can't collect the water off my roof? <laughs> And they said, yeah, that's right. That's and right. The farmers I remember out that. In the east, weren't allowed to mezzanine their farms to collect water. Mm -hmm. And so it's a challenge. So we have a, a very similar percentage in the cost, uh, the regulation to get things done. And that's probably going to get worse. But Alex, here, you're paying $70,000 for a water tap. That, is, uh, excuse me? $70,000 for a residential water tap. For an $800 water tap? <laughs> yeah, so to have rights to put a water tap in your home from any of the local municipalities is about 70 grand. That is unbelievable. Yeah, it's stunning. And so that's just the water tap. What yeah. what other kind of regulations are they dropping on you? Well, it so it varies from city to city. And so I really sort of look at um, Boulder is probably our analog, and Boulder is unusual because you know, the median home price there is about 1.25 million <laughs> in Fort Collins that keeps sort of etching up a little bit. And it's somewhere in the call it $550,000 range, but, uh, we're trying to figure out how to do affordable housing, right? That's the big challenge for everybody. And the ideas that keep coming back are all ideas that say, yeah, we need to push all these costs over to the builder. Right. Which, if you can tell me how that calculus works, that you push all the costs to the builders for them to build a cheaper home, 
Um, I'd love to hear how that works, but I haven't been able to figure it out. Well, of course, and we've been having these arguments with cities ever since I've been in this business for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've sat down at the uh, Dallas City Hall arguing with those folks for years and years. And we're doing the same thing here. And we're, we're hearing about an inclusionary zoning. We're hearing about linkage fees. There's even people having discussions about 1% growth rate caps, which both Berthoud and Lakewood tried that 10 years ago and they almost went broke. Well, so and, and, and the builders, uh, you know, from the builder's perspective, uh, I know guys that are, are saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll just take a little bit out of maybe my contingency fee or, I'll, or you know, I'll, I'll work a little cheaper or I'll cut some corners. At the end of the day, you're affecting the quality of the house. You're affecting the, the business's ability to make a profit. It doesn't do anybody any good. In the city, what are they gaining out of this but easy money? I mean, this, there's no reason for a, a $70,000 tap fee. That is absurd. Yeah, it is absurd. And that's that's what the builders wrestle with, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I hear this a lot. I sit on the board of directors of the Northern Colorado HBA, and we wrestle with these things. And one of the biggest things that the Home Builder Association does that nobody knows about is, you know, they've got a political action committees and we've got a governmental affairs committee mm -hmm. and we do ton of lobbying at the state, local and national level mm -hmm. to have the builders voices heard. But here it has almost become impossible to build a home for under $400,000, which is, to me is a stunning price, right? And a year ago, that was $300,000 way back a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so builders are doing things here like they're, they're shrinking the real estate. So they're putting homes on postage size lots, right. which doesn't appeal to a lot of people. And then they're cutting back on some of the upgrades and then they're doing away with basements. And it's funny because in Texas, nobody really has basements, right. which we should because it's hot there. That's but right. everybody in Colorado wants a three car garage and they want a basement, whether it's finished or not. Mm -hmm. And it's a real problem when builders want to sell something with a crawl space, but the consumer has to make decisions on either what are the things that I'm going to let go of? Or we've got a terrible saying here called drive till you qualify. Yes. <laughs> At $400,000. I mean, you're cutting yeah. out. And, and I was, uh, when you said that I was, my first thought was you're cutting out first time home buyers. I mean, you they, know, they, they um, just can't qualify for it. And think about if you're a, a college student or you just got out of college, you have college debt. You want to get, you, you, maybe you got married and you've got some kids. You want to get your first house. You know, this is not helping. No, it's not helping. And I work a ton with first time home buyers because it's super rewarding. Mm -hmm. And we try and light the path to home, home ownership for them. And if we can catch them in time to start thinking about, you know, let's get your credit in order. Let's get you in touch with a good banker. It's probably the most important decision you're ever going to make and sort of light that path. And we're having to teach people that you're probably not going to get your dream home. You got to build up to it but buy something, get a chip in the game to build equity. Because if you look back 40 years from the FHFA, the Federal Housing Finance Authority, this area grows at 6% a year. And we've only dropped over 2% twice in 87 and 2008. This year by comparison has been a little bit bubbly, but not like Florida or California or mm -hmm. Vegas or any of those places. Mm -hmm. And so it's a pretty good bet to just get involved in real estate early. And people, I met with a couple yesterday Two years later, they've got two kids and they're ready to upgrade. And they're like, John, we're so glad we bought this house in Millican because now we've got $100,000 in equity we can use to move over to buy next home. <laughs> that'll, cover the, that'll cover the lumber bill. Um, that, yeah, the, additional, the additional lumber bill. <laughs> I know. It's, it's really sad. sad. And yeah. to give you an idea of what it's like in our resale market, uh, and of course, the lower in pricing you go, the more competitive it gets. But we have five to 20 offers for every single listing. How many? five to 20 oh my god offers competing and so me and my partner stephanie woodard in the last call it 90 days have had about seven million dollars in listings from you know 250 up to a million and they just evaporated for over over asking price off the market but i have a couple now that moved here living in a hotel qualified to 480 put a contract in on a home at 405 and to win it, we had to write a contract for 450 with an escalation clause to 465, which got pushed to 461 
and to have appraisal gap language in there to pay up front for the appraisal. That is amazing. Hey, we're going to just, we need to take just, a, we need to take a quick break. If you'll hang on, okay. uh, it will be about a couple minutes. And then I want to talk about some of the remodeling industry, some of, some of how that's going and, okay. and continue our discussion. We're talking with John Taylor. He is a realtor in Colorado. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion. And as you guys know, I've been uh, talking to people from all over the country, and I'm getting the same story over and over. It's pretty amazing. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Imagine this, a totally customized, organized, and beautiful master closet. A home office that fits right into a perfect space. A pantry designed specifically for your storage needs. Imagine your home totally organized. It's time to call the design professionals at Closets by Design DFW and turn your dreams into a reality. With a design staff over 30 strong, Closets by Design works directly with you to create your dream space and they build it locally helping support the dfw community check them out at dallas.closetsbydesign.com or call them at 972-361-0010 use the promo code rrv to find out about the amazing specials and discounts available that's dallas.closetsbydesign.com or call them at 972-361-0010 and don't forget that promo code rrv Closets by design. It's only a few short weeks until we'll be running our air conditioners all day and all night. Hey, it's time to get an HVAC tune-up scheduled. Call my friends at Total Air and Heat in Plano, Texas at 972-881-0020 right now and get on their schedule for a tune-up. Don't wait for the long lines. Get ahead of the crowd. Total Air has been servicing North Dallas and Plano and Richardson areas for over 60 years. Steve and Justin Lawton sell and service carrier brand heating and cooling systems with Green Speed Intelligence Technology. So give them a call at 972-881-0020 or contact them at TotalAir.com. Hey, don't forget to follow us on all your social media, like us on Facebook, subscribe and share on YouTube, and check us out on all your social media platforms. Don't forget to watch Remodel Revolution on your smart TV, on Texas Weather Tracker TV, on Roku, Android, Apple, and Amazon TV, Sundays at 1 and 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Yeah. We're with John Taylor. John's a real estate agent in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. And we're talking about kind of the local real estate scene. Uh, in a minute, we're going to have Liz Newman join us. At we, uh, Liz, we apologize. We sent the, uh, we misspelled something in your, <laughs> in your email address, but we're, we just sent it right back out. So jump in when you can. Um, and we're talking about the, the challenges that it seems like everybody's having and one of the things that i'm fascinated about that doesn't get enough discussion and i'm not sure new home buyers or people buying new homes uh just built homes and custom homes understand that the regulation cost to builders is phenomenal uh it has gone up so high now you combine that with the additional lumber prices so john let's talk about uh, one of the things that's been all over the news and that is the futures prices of futures pricing of lumber. So the big story yesterday is that the futures pricing has dropped 40%. Well, that's the futures pricing. The, the current pricing is still $1,200 per board foot 
or um, for a thousand is it a thousand right. board a thousand per thousand board feet and um that is still three times almost four times higher than it was just a year ago and that's so we've got this combination of regulatory fees um, cities kind of climbing up in your business with you and now we've got the lumber companies and they're like oh we're, we're just kind of stuck here you know there's nothing we can do about it are your it, it, do you find this affecting your buyers is this you know it's got to be having some impact on the decision making process when you have these increased dollars Absolutely, it does. And I just recently learned that one of the reasons for that is because of the XL or the Keystone Pipeline with Canada, which I thought was kind of an unusual thing to find out. So the Canadians are not very happy about us canceling their pipeline because they need to ship their petroleum. So we're not getting a lot of lumber from Canada. So they're and not play, they're not playing nice. They're not playing nice. Mm -hmm. And then so here in the West, most of the land is publicly owned and we have a lot of activism here. So there's not a lot of uh, timber forestry going on in the Southeast. Most of it's privately owned. So you do have some of that. But the people that operate the mills, they'll add an additional shift maybe, but they're not going to go out and build another plant to add capacity. And they're like, we're having record profits why would we want to go out and do a capital outlay well, we're down we're down in east texas to th yeah. three or four mills uh you know where there used to be maybe 200 and, yeah. and i mean there was just there was just plenty there was plenty and now there's not and i've heard all kinds of excuses well you know the landowner's not making any more money than he was you know who's making the money that that's the question where's all this money going i don't really care uh, what I do care about is that they they get this thing turned around because it's affecting the econ it's going to start affecting the economy if it isn't already it's going to slow down and I'm hearing from all my builder friends and all the people I talk to around the country that this is actually starting to affect people's decision making and they're pulling back on projects and once they start pulling back on projects and they start canceling contracts or canceling projects or they just simply can't qualify, then you have a, you know, it, it compounds itself. It starts living off itself. And you, you just start, you start seeing recessionary uh, problems. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think is fascinating, another discussion that I want to have a lot more of, is the fact that these housing prices are going up, okay? All of this is going up. What about the salaries of the people that are going to purchase them? Because if it doesn't all go up or all, you know, we, we're thinking that maybe, well, all this stuff will drop back down by the fourth quarter of this year, maybe, to, but I think it sets a new base, a new base that's a lot higher. So we have a kind of a new ground game going. And if the, but if the people buying the houses, don't have an increase in their salaries where they can afford them, you know, we, we've got a whole nother problem to deal with. Well, you're hundred percent right. And if I had a crystal ball that actually worked, we'd be on my G6 right now. <laughs> <laughs> so Me I too. Can yeah. I can predict the future to about 30 seconds ago. Right. What I can, what I can tell you on the, on the builder side of it is just change the nature of the way they do business mm -hmm. with the public, whether it be, um, lottery sick, um, a lottery ticket type deal environment where um, people just stand in line. And if you show up on Sunday and you've got the lowest number, you get whatever house is being released. Wow. Or if you put in a, a refundable or non-refundable deposit, you get guaranteed a place in line. So every builder is looking at different ways of doing this. And it you can hardly, there's, it's very difficult here to go into a builder and dirt start a home and build it because the builders can't absorb, they don't have a crystal ball either, apparently. They may have G6s, but <laughs> they can't predict it either. And they won't lock in pricing until actually until the lumbers drop. So instead of seeing, um, call it semi-custom and track home builders, really specking out a home to a buyer's desires, they're kind of getting, you know, a, a speculative home with maybe a couple of options here and there. So. Well, it's a, it's a, it turns into a cost plus. And, and my, yeah. my builders uh, here, and I know it's the same there, have actually, the custom builders have gone to more of a cost plus 
type agreement because they don't really have a choice. They don't like it. They they really want a fixed cost deal, um, which would be typical. But they're having to change the way they do business, and that that's pretty astounding to me. Of course, I'm an old remodeler, so I've done cost right. plus all my life. I'm comfortable with it. But I can imagine if I was just building a product I wanted to sell and make a make a you know my profit margin on it, um, I, I'm not real comfortable with that because listen, cost plus is a whole different beast when you start when you start giving people options. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, someday you ought to come up here and come talk to our remodelers council at the HBA. They'd love to visit with you. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to. It sounds like fun. Just There's a me, business trip. Come on up. Yeah. Come see us. Give me an excuse. <laughs> yeah. So the remodeling in, uh, in in that part of the world, is is the remodeling industry as big as so, it's down here where you've got this giant city with all of these houses and all these big giant old homes that can be remodeled, which, of course, probably like there. It's probably the same there. A lot of them now are being torn down instead of remodeled because of the cost to remodel. You know, you do see quite a bit of that. And an interesting thing that we saw during COVID. So we suffered from a shortage of listings for a little while that really started the supply side problem began to drive up our pricing. And as it turns out now, we really have a demand problem because go figure people want to come here. But there was one of the four categories of people that didn't want to sell their home or the folks or the do-it-yourselfers. They stayed at home. They refinanced their loans at an all-time low, got 2.5% on a 30-year note. And I'm sure you pay attention to Lowe's and Home Depot yeah. stock. But people have been doing a ton of their own fix-it-up projects. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have great professional builders going in and doing big remodels, um, which there is a lot of that here, but there's been a ton of do-it-yourself activity here as well. That leads to, from, from the remodeler standpoint, that just leads to more business for us down the road when we get right. to go fix it. <laughs> I won't fix anything myself because I know better. <laughs> well, you know, the average, the average remodel has always been fought like $5,000. It's always been small, which has always right. told me that it was, you know, an average remodel is something that, it, that is a D, DIY type thing. Um, but things have changed so much in the last really, eight, you know, probably 24 months. It, it's, it was before COVID. We started having, it was tariffs that started it, actually. Right. Um, and I don't know when that was precisely, but probably 2017 or something like that, 2018. And we started having all the challenges getting things from overseas because of these tariff wars that we were in the middle of. And that started a whole new way of having to uh, order materials, when to order them, you know, getting appliances now, if you want high-end appliances, can take a year. I mean, I have builders telling me that they're finishing the house and the appliances are just arriving. That is amazing to me. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of dishwashers and refrigerators showing up, you know, like the day before people can get their certificate of occupancy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's always the, the the problem with building has always been the cabinets, right? It's mm -hmm. like, it seems like that's always where the problems start. Right. Here, we're lucky because we've got two great companies, Alpine Cabinets and Tharp Cabinets. So we haven't taken that hit here, but a lot of builders are lamenting about and having to switch out which types of appliances they're using because there's some of them you just can't get. Yes. And the last thing I think a builder wants to do is um, hold up closing on a home for a you know six hundred dollar dishwasher. Yeah, yeah, it's it's real frustrating. And and then you have all the you have the normal frustrations, which there are plenty. There's a whole book I'm writing called "Your House Was Not Built to Be Remodeled," and um, okay, it, it, and so. <laughs> It, it, it's all about these frustration. Not not all about it, but it, you know, part of it is about how frustrating it can be um, from everybody's perspective. The builder gets frustrated. The homeowner, the designer, the art, everybody goes through this. You know, a period of uh, you go through. You know, you're happy. You're energized. You're you're having your creativity moment, your team's all together and you start the project and then it starts getting frustrating right off the bat. And this is just adding to that. 
Well, I'll write a companion piece to that to say my house was not built to be remodeled by me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. I, okay. That sounds like fun. We need to work together on that. I like that I like a it. lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking time out for us today. It's been a fantastic discussion, and I hope you, you'll come back and do this some more with me. I've enjoyed Anytime. it so much. I really appreciate your time. It's great visiting with you, and we're serious about getting you up here. We'd love to get you up to the Fort Collins area. And uh, so you can have a business trip anytime. Well, let's, let's just do that. We'll work on that. Thank you so much. John Taylor from Fort Collins, Colorado. He is a Remax uh, real estate agent. And he has uh, really been a fun discussion. Thank you so much. Hey, check out our YouTube. Check out our Facebook, Pinterest. Check out our podcast. Our podcast is really getting popular. Uh, it's Remodel Revolution. It goes out on Spreaker, but you can find it on any podcast site. It's kind of everywhere. And stay in touch. Hey, send me emails if you've got any questions or any comments about the show, anything you've seen. Send me an email. We'll respond to it always. Thank you so much for watching the show. This is Alex Guthrie signing off until next week. Have a good week. Hey, don't forget to follow us on all your social media, like us on Facebook, subscribe and share on YouTube, and check us out on all your social media platforms. Don't forget to watch Remodel Revolution on your smart TV, on Texas Weather Tracker TV, on Roku, Android, Apple, and Amazon TV, Sundays at 1 and 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Well, we... Uh, we're joined today by uh, an old, old friend of mine. I've, I've got to fix my, my thing yes. here. Uh, old friend of mine, Liz Newman. And Liz is uh, an amazing woman. Liz was the, I think, second um, female president of the Dallas Builders Association. So Liz is a, a ceiling, glass ceiling breaker. <laughs> And she's also, also an awesome builder, but she is now doing something different in Colorado. Good morning, Liz. Good morning, Alex. How are you? I am fantastic now that I've got you here. How's it going? <laughs> going awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. It's great to have you. Tell us what you're doing in Colorado. Oh, well, mostly commercial, multifamily, uh, some storage building and development. And so I just had John Taylor on, which was really a lot of fun. And I think you know John. And uh, we were talking about some of the challenges that you guys are facing up there. And I wanted to talk to you about some of the regulatory issues that I'm sure you're running into as a developer. So you're like the development queen in this company. Yes, yes, you are. I know. Or, okay. You're the queen. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, for always being so kind. Hey, you are, listen, uh, just for our audience to know, Liz is a brilliant businesswoman and a brilliant builder. And so uh, that's why I wanted to have her here. I've known Liz for many years, and uh, she's an amazing person. So 25 years. How many? 25 years we've known each other. Oh, my God. I was God. thinking about that yesterday. Wow. I didn't know you were that old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you look great, darling. Um, so we miss you here in Dallas. Uh, but, but you know, uh, John just talked me into coming up to Colorado for a vacation, a working vacation. So I'll see you when I get there. I hope so. Talk, so let's talk about our storage building business. And, and really, it does relate to overall the construction industry is dealing with a lot of challenges. And I'm sure it's just as, as big a challenge in what you're doing. Well, uh, storage is extremely popular. It's been our bread and butter here for a few years. We've built over 3 million square feet of storage just in the front range of Colorado. Wow. Uh, we're doing it across the country now. Um, we have Maryland and uh, North Carolina, uh, California, um, and multifamily just as much. Uh, I'd say probably my development is mostly uh, multifamily at the moment. 
And um, all my multifamily is all modular. It, Everything I'm doing is modular. I even have explain home. that. Explain that to me. So modular building is all where it comes in in boxes that are 14 feet wide. They come in on trucks. They're all completely built out. Everything is a uh, completely constructed in a controlled environment. So Ooh. all of my colors and everything are chosen prior to uh, it arriving uh, on the back of the truck. And then it, it's hoisted up on a crane and, and placed upon podium construction. So it's so, called it's called packing and stacking. Yes, basically. <laughs> you know uh, that is very very interesting because uh, it, that has been coming into it's been in the discussion for decades, uh, and and I know in Europe it's a real popular way to build, but in our country we've we've been just you know stick nails and sticks. It's how we've been building them. Tell me some of the advantages to this, uh, this modular construction. Well, um, the reason I'm doing it is because of the lack of labor uh, and uh, you know, the ability to build sustainably. Um, one of my, uh, I've always been a green builder, as you know, yes. and all of my projects have solar involved on the rooftops of these high rise buildings and uh, the ability, ability to build within a controlled environment helps that as well as the materials I use within the buildings themselves. Um, but the modular build time is considerably less than stick building. Um, you know, I make up for the savings of time and the, the ability, I mean, the, uh, the transport of these uh, boxes because they come from so far, but we're making up for that in that new manufacturing plants here in Colorado that are coming out of the ground. So hopefully that's going to make up for it. But the timeline to build these buildings is cut so much that uh, it, it, it helps uh, in saving and labor costs, which we're having so much pr problems in getting labor, as mm -hmm. you well know. Yes. So that's helping us. Um, you know, um, we're, I'm building one of the first in Northern Colorado. So uh, we're looking forward to having that come out of the ground. Um, and that's in Longmont. And uh, then I have two coming out of the ground in Denver area. Um, one that is seven buildings that are four story tall and then one that's seven stories. Wow. And, uh, then I have seven a story more. modular building. I bet that's got some engineering uh, challenges along with that. Well, it's a steel building. It's oh, steel okay. Mod. Okay. All right. And then um, there's uh, an additional 32 acre town center that will have a, a few different modular buildings within it. So do you think this will translate into the residential home market at some point? It has because I have a 188 unit uh, modular project I'm doing in Laramie, Wyoming, that is all modular homes. And what I did with those is we're actually a chief uh, builder. We do chief modular, or excuse me, chief metal buildings for uh, a lot of our big metal project, metal buildings, our pre-engineered metal buildings. So uh, because Chief has a, a modular what, what home is, what's chief? What is Montanilla, Chief? What is Chief? Chief is a metal building company. Okay. And we are manufacturer's rep for them. Oh, I see. Okay. Macaulay Constructors is. Okay. And so we have a, a home building company called uh, uh Mountain West, we have Mountain West Constructors, which is our metal building company uh, that does chief homes, I mean, chief building. And then we have Mountain West Homes, so I'm getting a little confused here, Mountain West Homes, which does our home building. Uh -huh. And those homes are the Bonneville homes from Chief. Uh, chief makes Bonneville homes, which are modular homes. And that's what we're putting in our Laramie community uh, which is our Laramie development. So I, when you're doing, homes. I'm sorry to interrupt. When you're doing, um, when you're doing a modular home, what kind of foundation do you put under that? Those are strictly slab homes with four foot crawl spaces, unless the homeowner decides they want to have a full basement mm -hmm. and that will do a full uh, uh, basement for them, uh, whether they want to finish out or not, but the standard is just a four foot crawl space. So your on-site construction time sounds like it would be 
weeks. 12 weeks. Uh, it'd be what? 12 weeks. 12 weeks instead of 12 months, which it, right. which it would be right now. You don't have any big, how, how is the material cost that's been a problem for everybody? Is that affecting your, uh, your pricing at this point? It is. Uh, we have a, a floating uh, cost that they send to us based on what it is at the time that we have to absorb. Uh -huh. um, but we know what that get, what that figure is, and it can be applied at any time. And so we have that in there, knowing that we have to uh, adjust adjust our yeah. fee accordingly. Yeah. Um, is that but, uh, is that applied when you take possession when you take possession, or just upon completion at the factory? When you order it. When you order it. Okay. okay. At the time of order. That's interesting. What sort of options do, does somebody have when they do one of these modular homes? There are so many options available. However, in the time of ordering, because it, the lead time on these homes, because they're so popular right now, the lead time on homes are 28 weeks. <laughs> wow. So I don't have that luxury. So I have to pick them in advance and then place homes on certain lots uh -huh. in advance. And then let the client choose a home. I see. Because that. it's just too popular, and there's such a uh, there's just not enough homes that I have to just pick homes, put them on lots, and let a person choose a home that's already chosen. What kind of square footage are we talking about on these houses? These homes? Um, anywhere between eleven hundred ninety three square feet to uh, I think our largest one is eighteen seventy one. So they're they're probably a lot more affordable than a, a stick belt home i would imagine they're all under 300. oh wow that's great and and they're incredibly energy efficient correct and, and they are oh, they're all sustainable homes they're very very energy efficient uh -huh. um and, and they uh you can get them in a paired home or you could get them in a town home. So we have 40 town homes and we also have uh, half half of the subdivision is paired homes and half are single family homes. Wow, wow, that's incredible. I love this, I really do. And it sounds like it's working towards a solution for the future, it, it being that it's you have absolute control of the product, which is you know factory control product and you have a lot more control, I would imagine, I'm guessing at this, you can correct me, at the cost of it, uh, more so than when you're, when you're out there with a bunch of crews building a house by the piece. Absolutely, because um, you're only using a few subs. You're using your electrical to uh, plug it in. Um, you're, you're, you're using your HVAC guy because um, you may or may not have an AC up there in Laramie. Yeah, you know? that's right. Uh, Right. But you do have to have your furnace. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you have your flat work. Um, you, you have your plumbing. Um, only the, the plug and play has to go in there because everything's already done. So you just, you uh, just set it down and hook it up. Right. And then you have your framer to put on the garage. You mm -hmm. have your, but you do have to have your erector there that's going to make sure that the crane sets it there. Um, and he's called your set and finish guy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he does all the set and finish. And then the plumber, the mechanical and the electrical guy comes in and does the plug and play. And the flat work guy comes in and finishes. And then you have a framer come in and put a pergola up or whatever you're going to do. And yeah. the concrete guy comes in to put the steps in. So the difference uh, when you were building custom homes here in Dallas and, and any, any builder, right? Uh, and you have, I don't know, what, 20 subs maybe? maybe 20 subs, maybe you have, what we used to say that there is a, a million pieces to build a house. I don't know if that number is true or not, but um, it, there was a lot of decision-making, a lot of management, a lot of uh, having to put up with people that were like, you know, oh, uh, something happened, it's gonna be two weeks, whatever. Things you can't control as a builder. Uh, you've taken a lot of that out of the equation with this modular type home where you can just essentially set it down and hook it up and go. Pretty much. Yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. So- Because you know, I don't know that I could do a home like this personally. Um, <laughs> I've never done a, a, a level of home that I always did 800 up. Yeah. So this is yeah. much easier for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, it, and it's filling a gap that's really needed in the Laramie area. I mean. 
there's nothing like they have a lot of mobile home parks and things that are dilapidated and um, a lot of people that go to college up there at the University of Wyoming that there's just not a lot of homes. Um, and between there and Cheyenne, Wyoming right now, there was a total of 19 homes available three months ago. Oh my gosh. So we were the only subdivision coming in. You know, so, Liz, I, it sounds to me like this is a possible solution in a lot of different areas around the country though. It uh, is. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. the problem is, is I mean, I've gone into other communities with the same product and they just don't understand what it is. And so they, they think it's a mobile home. Right. And it's getting them to understand what the product is and how good a product it is. Because if you walk in one of these houses, you would not know it's not the same as walking into a, 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 a production home mm -hmm. once it's finished. Once you put all of the exterior landscaping and on everything, the, the, the home looks exactly like a regular home that uh -huh. you've just built with a lower end production home. Well, you know? and the, the thing is though, regardless of what, what what's happening with the cities is they're seeing this as kind of a windfall, this, this building boom we're in, it's a windfall for them. And so the regulations uh, or you know, the regulatory people are sticking it to the builders and, and which ultimately sticks it to the homeowner in fees and things like that. You and I have been through that here in Dallas a couple times in our career as, as we've had these building booms and all of a sudden the cities go, hey, we can get rich real quick. Um, does this type of building kind of skirt some of that? I mean, you probably have a different kind of fight on your hands with these cities. Like you say, they're looking at it like, Liz, you can't put a mobile home park here in the middle of my town. And you're, you're like, it's not a mobile home park. It's actually real houses. And, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, around the country, there's been a whole lot of, um, over the last few years, they've changed building codes where they're allowing mother-in-law, what we call mother-in-law houses, no offense to the mothers out there, uh, mother-in-law houses where they used to not because there's problems with where are people going to live. We've got to kind of relax some of our code restrictions to allow secondary homes on properties. Um, you know, the, I think that I, I love what you're doing. I think it's necessary. And I think in the future we have to maybe some, maybe we're a little spoiled sometimes on our first home buyers. It's, it's like first time home buyers. It's like, you don't really have to have that 6,000 square foot house, why don't you get one you can afford and then move up like your parents did? <laughs> you don't see a lot of that anymore. No, you don't. <laughs> They're going to the 450 yeah. and up. Right, 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 right. Wow, that's fantastic. So uh, how are, what, what's, on the, what's on the blocks for the future? How's, how's the rest of the year? What are you guys projecting for the rest of 2021? And uh, how are things looking for you around the country? Uh, well, I don't have uh, anything slowing down because most of the stuff that I do is multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we have storage, which had a, a slowdown uh, about a year ago, is picked back up again. Mm -hmm. And um, But it's mostly outside of the Colorado market where we had pretty much built so much um that uh, it's our relationships that are taking us out of the state to build in other st states basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so you know we're just picking up a work everywhere we can outside of the state because storage has just uh been one of you know we've gotten the best builder uh, across the nation for storage well storage you know storage says a whole lot about the mobility of the country and what people are doing. The more people move, the more they need storage. <laughs> right. And, and so, multifamily. The more yeah, multifamily yeah. gets built, the more storage is needed. And the yes. more, uh, you know, the uh, people that are moving out into the uh, suburbs and these smaller closets and all these, the, the, yeah. they need more space. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fascinating. Fascinating discussion with my good friend, Liz Newman, mm -hmm. with Macaulay Constructors in, uh, are you in Fort Collins? I'm in Windsor, Colorado. Windsor, Colorado. We also have a Denver office. Windsor's our corporate office. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, 
it's so great to see you. I really appreciate you jumping on with us and uh, kind of having this this discussion. I want to have some more of it. I'm I'm fascinated with these smaller homes because I have a tiny home, and I think that tiny homes are the future. Actually, I think they're the now uh, in, in a big way. Um, and one of the reasons I say that is because when I drive down a major highway out of out of the big city of Dallas, and I see RV park after RV park packed to the gill with people living in their RVs, and I think there there's a major uh, a major need for these smaller homes like you're doing. I just do. I, I think that's the direction we're going to have to be going in the future. So good for you. I'm proud of you. You've done awesome. Thanks, Alex. You're an amazing okay. lady. Liz Newman with Macaulay Constructors in Windsor, Colorado. Thank you so much. Uh, that's it for today's show. It's been so much fun. Send me your uh, questions or comments at alex at remodelrev.com. Check out all of our social media. Like us. We need more people to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's Remodel Revolution. And also, we'd love it if you'd like us on Facebook. Until next week, this is Alex Guthrie signing off. Thank you, and have a good week. Hey, don't forget to follow us on all your social media. Like us on Facebook, subscribe and share on YouTube, and check us out on all your social media platforms. Don't forget to watch Remodel Revolution on your smart TV, on Texas Weather Tracker TV, on Roku, Android, Apple, and Amazon TV, Sundays at 1 and 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. The views and opinions of this program are for educational and entertainment purposes only and are not intended to replace the recommendations of a hired professional. You can catch Remodel Revolution anytime. Follow the show on the website, RemodelRevolutionRadio.com or on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest using the handle at Remodel Revolution Radio. You can always listen to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and tune in. And watch the show anytime on YouTube.